welcome to this short session as part of Insights On Demand. So uh, my name's Graham Seed. I'm the European Research Manager at the Research and Thought Leadership Department in Cambridge Assessment English. And I'm here today to talk to you uh, just a little bit about the CFR and what's new in the CFR. It really will be just a quick whiz through everything. Now, if you know a little bit about the CFR, you might know that it's been around a while. In fact, it was first published in 2001 in this blue book here. And what you might not know is that it was recently updated. There has been a companion volume which was published uh, last year, and uh, I've got my copy here too. Uh, and it's important to note that the original 2001 version has been updated, it hasn't been replaced. So everything that was in the 2001 version is still relevant. It's just that the version that was published last year, the companion volume is more up to date, has more things in it, and I think is more useful actually as well. Now, if you know something about the CFR, what you probably know are the levels. And the levels go from C2 at the top for the most proficient language user down to A1 and pre-A1 at the bottom for, for the weakest or the least proficient language user. And all the levels in between going up A1, A2, B1, B2, C1, C2. And that's useful because we can chart progression using this scale. So say, for example, your learner is a B1 at English, uh, you can perhaps compare that against what they're like at other languages. This learner here, for example, is A1 in Chinese. You can also compare different skills. So maybe somebody's writing level is B2, but their reading is only B1. That also shows you what the next target is. So for my learner here on screen, their English is B1, so we know that the next rung up on the ladder is B2, and that's where we should be aiming at next. Similarly, for that same person who's Chinese is A1, A2 is the next step up for them. So you can see it be, can be used across a number of languages, not just English. What you might not know about the CFR, if you do know the levels, is what the approach behind it is. And the CFR talks a lot about this action-oriented approach. So what that means is the language learners, the language users are there to actually use and engage in the language in real life contexts. The CFR talks about the learner as being a social agent, somebody who moves and has agency in a real world context. They are wanting to use language for real purposes, not just studying for the sake of studying. Now, as educators, as maybe teachers of English as a foreign language, we need to think about some questions as to what that means for us. So, for example, do the activities in our lessons encourage learners to do real world communicative tasks, tasks that are, and that are going to be useful to them in the real world? And therefore that makes us think, well, what do we know about our learners? How can we make learning activities specific to their needs? And therefore, how can the CFR help? Now, Perhaps you know that in the CFR we have what's called can-do descriptors. These are statements which talk about what a language learner can do at a certain level of proficiency. So the CFR contains lots of different scales and the example on screen here is of writing, overall writing. What can a language learner do generally speaking, in terms of their writing. And in this scale, which talks about writing, we can see the CFR levels uh, with C2, the most proficient at the top, going down to pre-A1, as I said, the, the, the least proficient at the bottom. And next to each, we have descriptors, which describe or, or give an indication of what a language learner 
can do at that point in time, at the level that they're at. So if we know that my language learner is B2 level, I can have a look and see what the descriptor says for writing, and that will tell me what they should be able to do at B2. Similarly, if you know what a language learner can do, but you don't know what level they're at, you can match it up that way as well. Now, that's always been the case uh, in the CFR since the initial publication in 2001. But what I want to do now is just have a quick look at three of perhaps the most important new developments that have happened in the new companion volume. So uh, the first is, is more a question of how the descriptors are organised. I think we're well aware of the categorization of language into the four skills, reading, writing, listening, speaking. But the companion volume now looks at language activities divided into these four modes of communication. The first is reception, so receiving language, so listening and, and reading. The second is production, so that's simple speaking like I'm doing now or writing. And then comes interaction. So interaction is obviously if I'm having a conversation and uh, I'm speaking, somebody else is listening, uh, they're listening in order to be able to respond and speak back to me, uh, and then I become a listener. So that's an, a mix of skills there, and it doesn't only happen with speaking and listening, it can happen with speaking and reading, writing and reading, different forms. And then fourthly, we have this very interesting concept of mediation. And mediation means when we mediate language from one context to another. So we are usually, we're taking the same content, but we might be changing it we're mediating that content so that somebody else understands it better in their context. So, for example, that might be between a, a formal piece of language that we're reading and then we are saying, oh, I've read this complicated report, but what it means is this. And so we're changing it from formal language into informal language so that somebody else can understand. Uh, and we are reading it and then changing it into production where we're speaking it. So I'm being a mediator in that case. I'm, I'm keeping the content the same, but I'm changing the way that the language is delivered. Uh, there's a lot more to mediation, but I haven't got time to describe that now. But fundamentally, that's what it is. So that's one key change in the approach of how we categorise language. And I think that's really, really interesting for us as teachers to reflect on what sorts of language we teach and we help our learners learn. Now, the next uh, change that I want to highlight is the use of language online. 20 years ago, of course, this wasn't so much of an issue, but now we have to deal with the fact that a lot of language uh, is communicated online. And so there are two new scales in the CFR, uh, online conversation and discussion, and goal-oriented online transaction and collaboration. Uh, and those have descriptors in at each of the levels that you can use and refer to. And the third new feature in the CFR, which I want to highlight today, is this introduction of a new pre-A1 level. So at the very uh, bottom or the very start, let's say, of a language learner's journey to learning a particular language. And that's helpful because it gives them encouragement. It, it starts them off. It provides the first step on their language learning journey, um, particularly useful and relevant for younger learners, of course. My time's almost running out, um, so I'm finally going to finish with Asking the question, well, how can you make use of the CFR for us as teachers? What, what can uh, you do? First of all, of course, you can use the CFR by checking that the coursework or that the exams that you are, are dealing with uh, are aligned to the CFR or are influenced or are inspired by the CFR. And, and that helps you to know that there's that clear sense of progression, that clear sense of direction 
and that clear sense of those activities are grounded in the communicative approach of using language for a, a real world purpose. You can also use the CFR descriptors yourself as teachers, uh, if you like. You can use it as a sort of needs analysis to identify, well, what do my learners know? Uh, what don't they know? Um, and then you can create learning objectives or even learning activities for the class based around those needs. You can then sequence those activities into a logical progression so that you know the learners are, are progressing at an appropriate rate of what they should be doing level by level as they work their way up through those CFR levels. Then you can create different assessments, uh, formative and progress assessments to, to check that your learners are at those levels. And finally, you can even give it to the students themselves uh, and do a bit of self-assessment. Those are briefly some ways of what you can do and what you can use the CFR for. Uh, my time's run out, but thank you very much. Uh, it's bye-bye from me and thank you very much for watching.